So good evening, everyone, and welcome to a new academic year of VKC Talks. Um, and Maya let me know earlier that this is actually the 10th year of um, VKC Talks. So that's kind of a bit of a milestone for this year. Um, so uh, my name is Amy Maley. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a master's student at UBC and I'm this year's BKC host. And I also have with me here virtually Maya Kopalova, who is our convener. And BKC is a series of seminars for diamond geology and related topics. And our goal is to bring academics and industry professionals together. Um, I would like to acknowledge SRK Consulting for being a long-standing VKC sponsor. Um, and just to let everyone know, uh, the presentations are recorded. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll stop recording and we'll kind of move on to an informal um, kind of happy hour. But um, you can find all of the recordings on the VKC YouTube channel as well. And just a few housekeeping notes before we kind of get started here is please make sure that your microphones and cameras are off during the presentation just to ensure the best possible quality of streaming. And the presentation will be about 50 minutes long. And please keep your questions until the end, um, at which point I will help to facilitate a question and answer period. And then again, after that, we'll move into that more informal happy hour. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. So today we are going to be hearing from Dr. Andy Moore, who is an adjunct professor at Rhodes University in South Africa. And Andy provided me with a very good bio, which I'm thankful for. Um, Andy holds a PhD from the University of Cape Town um, based on a geochemical study of two clusters of olivine melolites in the Namakaland and Bushman, Bushmanland area of Northwest South Africa. His academic background, unfortunately, did not include a health warning about the addictive nature of diamonds, and he consequently spent a major part of his career searching for those elusive chunks of carbon. This included initiating diamond exploration projects in Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, as well as managing a diamond exploration program in Madagascar. The result um, was the discovery of a number of kimberlites, none of which were viable, but he missed the economic Maroa kimberlite in Zimbabwe by about 15 kilometers. And Wolfie Marks, a fellow student of his and a serial diamond prospector, eventually explained that perhaps the famous De Beers ad was a misrepresentation and should rather read, a diamond takes forever to find. Um, However, diamond prospecting was an introduction to the fascinating world of geomorphology and evidence of where ancient rivers and glaciers once flowed or didn't, and how this related to plant and animal evolution and distribution. And more recently, Addy has become involved in, in nickel and gold exploration projects in Botswana, but he's still, of course, happy to tell people um, how he would go about making diamonds if given the responsibility to do so. So I am going to pass things over to Andy right now. I'll stop sharing my screen. And if you could share your screen there, Andy. Uh, there we go. Perfect. Have you got that, Amy? Yep, I can see it. You just need to put it into presentation mode again, and we should be good to go. Um, it was up at the far left where you click from beginning. Uh, from current slide share, sorry. From current slide will work too. There we go. Perfect. Good. Good. Thanks for the introduction, Amy, and uh, many thanks for the invitation to. Uh, Give this talk um, and uh, good morning everybody a very good early morning from Botswana where it's some horrendous hour um, this uh, talk is based on uh, a project I've been doing with Herb, Herb Helmstead who I'm sure doesn't need any introduction uh, so he's my partner in crime and uh, I'm going to discuss how we'd make clipper diamonds uh, if we were given the responsibility to do so. Uh, just some basic Diamonds 101. 
Uh, the majority of diamonds come from uh, two main mental parogenesis, uh, ecrogitic and prototitic, uh, as evidenced by the diamond inclusions. And on the left um, are the carbon isotopic signatures of these two parogenesis. Uh, going to the left, you, you're getting more uh, richer in carbon-12, the light carbon isotopic signature. And um, both the ecrogitic and the prototitic uh, associations have a pronounced peak around minus five, a, a mantle isotopic peak. Then uh, there appear to be uh, a subordinate group of diamonds that come from or, or are linked to Websterites. And then more recently, uh, diamond inclusions have been found, which appear to have a deep provenance from the mantle transition zone, depths below 400 kilometers, extending into the upper part of the lower mantle. And these are the sublithospheric or super deep diamonds. Uh, nitrogen is a common impurity in diamonds, and nitrogen bearing diamonds are termed type one diamonds with all the imagination of geologists and naming diamonds. And the presence of nitrogen gives the stone uh, a yellow color. But uh, a smaller proportion of diamonds uh, lack nitrogen. And the absence of nitrogen gives these stones a beautiful white color. This is a population from uh, Let's Sing. Uh, some of these stones, uh, nitrogen-free stones, are large. This is the Litzing province, uh, Promise, which weighed in at uh, 603 carats. And then a small proportion of these nitrogen-free stones, uh, which are termed type two diamonds, type two simply nitrogen-free, a small proportion have boron as, as an impurity, and this gives the stones a blue color. And it's these stones that we're going to be talking about today. And uh, they're important because the, the, the three of the world's largest gemstones are all type two diamonds, nitrogen free diamonds. The, the Cullinan, which was found in 1905, weighed in at uh, over half a kilogram. And in a recent study published in Science by Evan Smith and co workers, they coined the apt acronym for these uh, nitrogen-free stones, uh, clippers, and this acronym stands for Cullinan-like, large, inclusion poor, relatively pure, irregularly shaped and resorbed. And I flagged irregularly shaped here. Um, the, the, the morphology of these stones is typically irregular, you don't get the um, crystal forms, uh, the, the uh, dodex and octaves that we normally associate with diamonds. And the late John Gurney was adamant that you could actually recognize these uh, large nitrogen free stones on, on the basis of their morphology. So we're looking at a, a, a petrographically distinct diamond population. And just to underscore that, um, these large diamonds again, all irregular stones. Uh, this one has cleavage faces that they, they, they do cleave more readily than other diamonds. Now, um, economically, these stones are important because they can have a major impact on Kimberlite economics. And the example that's always trotted out is the Metsing Kimberlite, high up in the Lesotho Highlands. And despite, it's the lowest grade Kimberlite in the world, but despite, but despite the low grade, the presence of the, these clipper diamonds gives the, uh, the parcel a high average value, which makes it economic. But at the moment, in, in order to um, determine if these desirable stones are there, you, the only way of doing it is a, a bulk sample. And, uh, it would obviously be uh, very useful to have a proxy for um, a comparable to the use of T, uh, G10 garnets to determine whether these stones may or may not be present. And this presumably means that we need to know something about their, um, their, their formation, uh, how these uh, large irregular clipper diamonds form. 
And there are currently, I think, two main models. Uh, the first is that they have a super deep provenance. Uh, this was proposed by Evan Smith and co-workers in their 2016 science paper. I, th I think this is by far the most widely accepted model. Uh, if this is correct and we want to develop a, uh, a proxy for predicting these stones, uh, we, we need to know something about low mantle processes and mineralogy. Uh, the second model is one that I've pushed for several years, and this is that they're linked to the Megacris suite. And if this model is correct, it means we, ne we need to know something about Megacris and how they form. So let's just kick off by looking at the evidence for super, uh, super deep or sublithospheric provenance. And this was based on the uh, science study published in 2016. Uh, a very meticulous study uh, at the GIA where they screened a very large number of diamonds looking for nitrogen-free stones that had inclusions which differed from known lithospheric and sublithospheric parogenesis. And one of the keys to the study was recognizing that graphite could be masking inclusions. And by homing in on the graphite, they picked uh, a number of inclusions, including uh, a high proportion of nickel iron alloys and uh, a number of other phases, which they considered a, a new parogenesis. And one of the important observations was that uh, some of their stones were very large. Uh, prior to the study, all of the sublithospheric diamonds that had been reported were very small, millimeter size. Uh, this cut stone was over 10 carats. So the uncut stone must have been at least double that. So this study produced a group of nitrogen free stones uh, with an unusual group of um, inclusions, including this uh, high proportion of nickel iron alloys and carbides. And it was suggested that uh, these diamonds were linked to the clippers. Now, um, one of the first observations is that um, and many of the diamonds selected in the study from the screening had uh, a high proportion of inclusions. And uh, I think this is a bit of a red flag because by definition, the, the clipper diamonds are inclusion poor. So uh, perhaps the first red flag, many of the diamonds had abundant uh, inclusions. Uh, then there's subsequent to the study, there's been um, a, a lot of new data that's come in. And uh, some of this data, I think, um, or some of these data um, also conflict with the super deep model. Uh, this shows the on, on the left the carbon isotopic signature of diamonds from Cullinan, previously known as the Premier Kimberlite. And uh, way back in 1983, Judith Millage uh, analyzed uh, clipper diamonds from this locality and uh, showed that these clipper diamonds uh, are characterized by light carbon isotopic signatures. Uh, although a couple of them had heavier signatures. Um, the, the blue symbols are, are boron bearing 2B diamonds. So um, uh, a very early study uh, indicating that these, these clipper diamonds have this um, uh, isotopic signature bias towards light uh, carbon isotopes. Now, subsequent studies have identified sublithospheric, peridotitic, and um, ecligitic suites at Cullinan. And the inclusions range from the lower mantle through the transition zone up into the upper mantle. So um, at Cullinan, we've sampled a, a large section of the mantle. And uh, perhaps an unexpected finding is that in each of the remaining three provenances, uh, there were nitrogen-free diamonds. So each of these three groups of diamonds had a range of diamonds from nitrogen-free to nitrogen-bearing. 
So there's not one single nitrogen-free box, the clipper box. In fact, you get nitrogen-free stones in each para of, of these parageneses. And so this raises the question, if you get uh, a sublithospheric stone with inclusions, uh, is that stone linked to the clippers? Uh, the same, same would apply for stones with peridotitic or ecliptic inclusions. Um, the the sublithospheric suite from Premier, uh, the Cullinan one, sorry, uh, is biased towards mantle isotopic signatures. It looks rather different from the signature of the clippers. So this is raising a question mark as to whether these sublithospheric stones are in fact linked to the clippers. So um, the other way of looking at this is if you get a, a, an inclusion bearing nitrogen free stone, uh, you have to find some independent uh, evidence to either link it or not to the, to the clipper population. Then uh, some further data that uh, came in at the second Kimberlite conference uh, was published by Annetta Bannis and her co-workers. And um, she identified what she inferred to be clipper stones described as being irregular uh, from the lead seeing Kimberlite. This is a, a, another important clipper producer. And the clipper population that she analyzed like Premier was biased towards light carbon isotopic signatures, although a subpopulation with heavier carbon isotopic signatures. Uh, these were the stones, the sublithospheric stones with uh, nickel iron uh, and alloys and carbide inclusions um, from Letseng. Very small sample size, but uh, it doesn't look as, as if it's uh, linked to the clipper population, but uh, it's a small sample size so that it doesn't rule this out. But uh, certainly it doesn't provide support for this link. Then um, on, in the left-hand column, I've summarized the phases that were reported in the diamonds from the 2016 study. And the majority of these uh, have been previously reported at Juina. This is an alluvial deposit in Brazil, uh, which is notable for a high proportion of sublithospheric stones. And uh, the majority of the stones reported uh, in, in the science study had, had previously been recognized at Juina. And one of the characteristics of the Juina diamonds is that many of them had hydrogen impurities and some of the stones from the study uh, also had hydrogen impurities. So I think this raises the question of whether or not uh, this actually represents uh, a previously unrecognized parogenesis. Uh, then one of the phases reported in the study was brayite, and uh, the, the proof is a field for stability field for brayite. It's the intermediate pressure polymorph of CaSO3, the shallow pressure polymorphs will last tonight, and then there's uh, a high pressure phase with a perovskite structure. And it's often assumed that if you get brayite, that it's inverted from CaSO3 perovskite, the, the perovskite structured phase. So it's, it's a proxy for um, indicating a sublithospheric provenance. But uh, the stability field extends right into the uh, into lithospheric PT conditions. So what this means is if you have a diamond like this with brayite inclusions, it's, uh, it's a type two stone, it's nitrogen free, a very regular, clearly a clipper, like many clippers that has graphite inclusions. The, the pink colors linked to plastic deformation. So what do these brayite inclusions uh, signify? Is it lithospheric or sublithospheric? And um, 
I think at best this is an open question. So there's the question of uh, the interpretation of Brayard. So this is a summary of the concerns that we have. Uh, many of the stones were inclusion rich. Uh, it infers a, a previously unrecognized type two paragenesis that many of the phases have previously been reported at Chewina. There's the problem with uh, Brayart, and then uh, the sublithospheric stones, a small population of them from Let's Sing, seem to be isotopically different from the associated um, clipper diamonds, although it should be emphasized that, it, that there's only a small population of these sublithospheric diamonds at, at this locality. Um, but we feel that the collective evidence doesn't provide strong support for a sublithospheric origin for clipper diamonds. So let's look at the evidence for clipper megacrystalling. These are megacrysts, large single crystals, uh, greater than 10 millimeters was the original definition. The, the common ones are garnets, most of these are garnets, but orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene, olivine. Gilmanite is a, 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 a common megacrist phase, and rare zircons are some of the other megacrysts. So an assemblage of uh, very large crystals, sometimes intergrown with other megacrist phases. Um, but in addition to these large megacrysts, you sometimes get uh, mantle modules like this one. Uh, this was described by Barry Dawson and his student at the second IKC. Uh, it's composed of intergrown OPX and CPX and ilmenite, uh, which have compositions that indicate they link to the megacrysts suite, but the texture indicates uh, rapid crystallization or quenching. That's a, um, a large view. And this is a, a view fo focusing in on, on this area over here. And uh, so th there's a subpopulation with compositions pointing to a link to the megacrist suite, but the textures indicate rapid crystallization. Then also at the second IKC, Dave Egler and co-workers reported that the state line Kimberlites had apparently two megacrist suites, one shown in red, which was relatively chrome rich, and the second that was chrome poor. And um, from reading the paper, it appears that they considered these to be separate suites. But very occasionally you, you see phases uh, that seem to be linked to these two megacrist suites in, in, in single hand specimen. Um, this was uh, from a paper at the second IKC by Henry Mayer. He described what he called a unique instantite megacrist, which is the gray. And this enclosed an orange, relatively chrome poor garnet, which in turn it enclosed a pink chrome rich garnet which enclosed a, a chrome rich diopside. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and um, he said that this nodule appeared to uh, include a chrome poor and chrome rich sweets. And uh, he pointed out that the chrome rich garnets uh, were very similar to, sorry, the chrome poor garnets were very similar to, to those of the chrome poor megacrist sweet. This was the pink chrome rich garnet. And he pointed out that it was very different from garnets in, in garnet peridotites, this uh, field outlined by the dotted line. He, he didn't speculate on the nature of this, but uh, in a paper that, that I wrote some time ago with Alina Bella um, we pointed out that it was very similar in composition to the, the, the chrome rich uh, megacrysts, and we suggested that. Um, it was indeed a chrome rich megacrist. And so um, you do occasionally get these two suites present in the same hand specimen. And we described uh, two other nodules which had 
prone rich and prone poor uh, garnets in the same hand specimen. So prone rich and prone poor megatrist sweets. So just to summarize some of the megatrist characteristics, I'll just highlight the important ones. Firstly, generally, generally a large size, but there's a subset that shows evidence for rapid crystallization. Chrome rich and chrome poor sweets, occasionally present in the same hand specimen. And then uh, something I haven't mentioned is that Zirk the, the zircon megatrists have been dated and they give ages just prior to Kimberlite eruption ages, uh, ranging from zero to five to 10 years prior to eruption. So the zircon megatrist ages indicate that the megatrist suite had a, a short mantle residence time prior to being included by the Kimberlite magma on eruption. Now, before going on to the pretty flipper diamonds, I want to talk about a rather ugly diamond called Framosite. It's a polycrystalline diamond. It's composed of lots of tiny uh, diamond crystallites tightly welded together. Uh, this is another one up here. Sometimes they, they coarser grained. You can see a coarse individual diamond uh, crystals growing here. So it's a polycrystalline diamond. Um, and it's generally considered to have a very enigmatic uh, origin. What we do know about these uh, framosites is that uh, garnet is the most common inclusion. And the, the garnets have been recognized to occur as discrete chrome rich and chrome poor populations, uh, sometimes present in the same diamond. Might be sounding like something you've heard before. Uh, olivine's notably absent in, in both the, the, the subgroups. And um, the garnets have generally been linked to the Websterite suite. So it's been suggested that these framosites have a Websterite link. And this was based on a study of uh, a large sample of framosites uh, held at the v uh, Vienna Museum outlined by this blue line, or, or these are the ones with the, the chrome poor uh, garnets, the, the line field of, of the diamonds, the, the framosites with the chrome rich garnets. They overlap in MGFE space, but uh, they have distinctly different um, uh, chrome contents. And um, it was suggested because that because you had a, a wide relatively invariant range of, of calcium that this uh, pointed to a Websterite link. Uh, the crosses are inferred Websterite inclusions, uh, two of them, two I think, from uh, Venetia. Uh, they um, show similar, they plot broadly within this field. Uh, they're very different from the associated uh, ecloglytic stones at, at Venetia. So um, it was suggested that uh, the um, Framosite diamonds have a, have a Websterite parogenesis. But the orange symbols are megacrysts. Uh, they, the, they're from a number of localities. Uh, one's from um, Monastery, the type area for megacrysts. Uh, the, the others are from uh, a Kimberlite in Angola. I have haven't I could have plotted more which would have plotted in this field, but I've left them out just for clarity. So you have a problem that uh, the the megatrists are certainly in CAMGFE space, very similar to the Websterites. And if you look at other discriminators such as titanium, um, this gives uh, ambiguous answers. So um, there's a strong overlap of the megatrist suite. Uh, with the Websterite suite. And um, this is saying that distinguishing between these two suites simply on, um, uh, on, on chem chemical composition um, uh, just doesn't work. So we need some sort of uh, alternative um, lines of evidence to, to link them to one or other of either the Megatrist suite or the 
uh, the Webb's drive paragenesis. So just to um, look at, I'll, I'll just highlight some of the important uh, properties of these framosites. Some can be very large. Uh, when I say large, up to 100 carats. Uh, the uh, textures are, in, are interpreted to reflect rapid crystallization. Um, the inclusions have been characterized as websteritic, but there's a strong similarity to, to megacris. This is referring to the barnets. You get, get chrome-rich and chrome-poor sweets, occasionally coexisting in the same sample. And then um, uh, one of the garnets was described as having zoning, which is interpreted to indicate uh, um, crystallization of the framosite just prior to incorporation by the kimberlite, in other words, uh, a short mantle residence time. And some of them show very low aggregation states. And this is also inferred to reflect uh, short mantle residence time. So some of these framosites seem to have formed just prior to kimberlite eruption. And then um, very importantly, the framosites have a very unusual but highly diagnostic carbon isotopic signature. And this is shown for, for four individual localities in the bottom four panes. Uh, this is the Vienna collection. And uh, the red show uh, framosites with inclusions, the purple inclusion free, but they show, tell a similar story. And that's that the majority of the stones are biased towards light carbon isotopic signatures, but you get a subpopulation which is slightly heavier carbon isotopic signatures. This is the um, combined field uh, up at the top here. And very different from the um, fields for eclogitic and pyridotitic um, diamonds, which have this prominent mantle mode around about minus five. So highly unusual, um, very distinctive carbon isotopic signature. Now, if we compare the characteristics of megacrysts and framosites, and I'm just going to highlight the most important ones, um, both can be very large. The framosites uh, are inferred to reflect rapid crystallization. Uh, there's a subgroup of megacrysts which show uh, quench textures, rapid crystallization textures. The megacrysts formed broadly co coevally or just before kimberlite eruption. And the same applies to at least some of the, the framosites. Both have um, a chrome rich and chrome poor subsuites, which occasionally occur in the same hand specimen. And uh, these are remarkable parallels. And we feel they're so remarkable that they indicate that the framosites are linked to the megacrysts rather than the, the websterites. And um, to my knowledge, for example, uh, I'm not aware of, of websterites being divided into chrome rich and chrome poor populations. And uh, generally the websterites have well equilibrated textures, which indicates that they've had a significant mental residence time. So collectively, the evidence suggests that the framosites are part of the megacris suite. I, 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 well, I'm convinced, I hope you are. Um, and they link to the megacris rather than the websterites. So the implication is that this ugly diamond is in fact part of the uh, megacris suite. And this has an important corollary, and that's that the websterite suite, suite must, must now be acknowledged as a distinct diamond paragenesis. And this includes framosite. And importantly, the framosite has a very distinctive carbon isotopic signature. And this is the carbon isotopic signature here, biased towards uh, carbon-12, the, the light carbon isotope. Then this shows the signature of the clipper diamonds from two important producers, Cullinan or, or the old premium, premium, premium mine. 
uh, and let's sing. And like the Framer sites, the, the diamonds are biased largely towards light carbon isotopic signatures, but there is a small subpopulation with heavier carbon isotopic signatures. So very striking isotopic parallels between the clippers and the Framer sites, um, which I believe suggest strongly that they link to, the, to a common paragenesis. And just to emphasize, these are the metal carbide bearing diamonds from Letseng, small population, but they don't provide strong support for link to the uh, associated clipper population. So um, on the basis of these very similar, unusual carbon isotopic signatures, we feel that the framosites and the clippers are linked. In other words, the clippers are part of the megacris suite. And just to flag that, uh, textually, they, they're megacris, um, very large um, stones, uh, many of them greater than 10 millimeters in, in maximum diameter. So this raises the uh, rather controversial question of how megacris form. And this is a um, probably uh, one of the important unresolved topics of, of Kimberlite uh, um, science. But I think that if you want to explain them, you have to go back to some of the early observations. And at Monastery, which is arguably the type area for or type locality for megachrists, uh, John Gurney at the Second in International Kimberlite Conference pointed out that the monastery megachrists formed essentially isobarically over a wide range of temperatures heading towards the uh, graphite diamond inversion curve. Uh, his, one of his students, Jenny Hopps, showed a similar relationship at Jagasfontein, a, a range of crystallization temperatures, but effectively isobaric crystallization. And Dan Schulze uh, found a similar relationship at Hamilton Branch. So any model for the megachrists, I believe, has to explain essentially isobaric crystallization over a range of temperatures. And this is an adaptation of a model that was developed by Ben Hart and John Gurney to account for these relationships. And what they suggested was you had a pooled magma body in the mantle. Uh, they were silent on the nature of the magma body. Uh, we, we think it's, it's likely the Kimberlite, but that's not critical that uh, you, a, a thermal aureole developed around this uh, magma body and small amounts of magma were injected into a fracture network within this thermal aureole and the, the megachrists formed uh, as effectively pegmatitic veins um, crystallizing uh, within this fracture network down this temperature gradient. And, uh, we suggest that the clippers are um, simply part of the low temperature end of this crystallization sequence down here, and that the clippers formed where crystallization extended from the graphite stability field into the diamond stability field. So we see the, 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 the clipper diamonds as being low temperature um, representatives of the megachrist suite. Now, um, it's likely that this pooled magma would have um, experienced some sort of tec <coughs> tectonic activity, uh, particularly just prior to eruption. Oh, sorry, just a step back. Dan Schulze pointed out that uh, the low temperature megachrists would have been above the Kimberlite solidus. So he noted that the, <coughs> that the megachrists would have been associated with residual liquids. Uh, these are these um, uh, areas shown in blue. And if you've got any tectonic um, activity, probably particularly just prior to Kimberlite eruption, uh, 
fracturing would potentially result in loss of volatiles. And we suggest that uh, loss of volatiles causes rap rapid quenching. So we get these uh, nodules with uh, megacris with or, or, or minerals linked to the megacris compositionally, but with quenched textures. And we suggest the framosites are down the equivalence of that. So we see the <coughs> the framosites and the the clipper diamonds as being integrally in, integrally linked to the um, the megacris paragenesis. And just to sh show a, a crustal analog, uh, this is from a paper by Weber and, and co-workers describing uh, pegmatites from California. And uh, they pointed out that the, the coarse phases in the pegmatites uh, were coarse because the buildup of volatiles allowed, uh, it, it, it uh, inhibited nucleation and this allowed um, the growth of coarse crystals that was the lack of interference. And although the, the, the crystals were large, the, the, the crystallization times were necessarily very long. They estimated perhaps thousands of years. Um, they pointed out that uh, if the, 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 the parent liquid cooled against wall rocks, it would quench and this formed aplites. And, and they also commented that the aplites would form if there was any uh, tectonic activity and you lost volatiles, this would trigger rapid quenching. So um, these quench nodules we see as analogs of the aplites and the big nodules and the, the, the big clipper diamonds as analogs of the pegmatites, the, the coarse minerals in, in pegmatites. So this brings us to the question of, can we use all this information to develop a proxy for predicting the presence or absence of, of clipper diamonds? And uh, this map shows the, the most important clipper producers. They're all group one kimberlites. They're, they're shown in red, a number of them in the Arapa field, Peroi, uh, probably one of the most, the, the better known of these, but also a number of others. Uh, John Eng, uh, these two are in Botswana, Jagas Fontaine and Premier in um, South Africa and Let's Sing in Lesotho. Uh, Premier is 1100 um, million years old. The others are all um, mid-Cretaceous. But strikingly, the, the triangles show the group two Kimberlites and these apparently lack clipper diamonds. So perhaps the first question we have to ask is why don't you get clippers in group two kimberlites? And this was a, a suggested explanation uh, which I made several years ago. And I suggested that um, if you looked at the, these omega crisp garnets uh, from the star kimberlite, which is a, a group two kimberlite, monastery of group one kimberlite. And I suggested that as a very crude approximation, the magnesium number of the garnets is, is a proxy for temperature. So temperature going in this direction and pointed out that the, the garnet megacris from star showed a much more restricted compositional range than at monastery. Monastery went down to about magnesium number of 66. And I suggested that um, this a wider range of crystallization in the monastery megacrysts reflected crystallization over a higher temperature range, uh, going into temperatures within the diamond stability field. Monastery has produced clipper diamonds, by the way. And um, so, so this more extensive range of crystallization into the diamond stability field would explain the presence of clippers in some group one kimberlites. I suggested that for whatever reason, uh, because the, the, the uh, megacrysts in the group two kimberlites formed over a much more restricted range, that crystallization terminated at higher temperatures within the graphite stability field. So 
uh, the megatrist suite never crystallized diamond. So a suggested link between megatrist compositions and the presence or absence of diamonds. And this seems to be supported by olivine compositions. Uh, not only do group two kimolites lack um, uh, triple diamonds, but they seem to be, they have been reported from lac to gra, but they, they appear to be very rare. And um, I think olivine uh, megatrist compositions are uh, backing up a link between uh, with, with the presence or absence of clipper diamonds. And uh, this just shows uh, olivine compositions from pipes in the Kimberley area, recent paper by Roger Mitchell. We won't discuss the, uh, the, the olivines in particular, but the important uh, point to home into is the olivine edges form a well-defined field but relative to these edges, there's an olivine population that is iron rich. Uh, these olivines will show reverse sonation. And um, these have been linked to the, the Megacris suite. Uh, and um, I, I, I would certainly agree with this. So these iron rich olivines, uh, relative to the edges, uh, I believe are, are Megacris. This is suggested by Roger Mitchell and his co-workers as well. This shows, um, let's say, an important clipper producer, the crosses of the edge compositions, the triangles are, are the more iron-rich ones, showing reverse sonation. And the important thing is, if you, if you look at the, the iron-rich, the, the megacrist olivines at let's say, they go down to pretty iron-rich co uh, compositions uh, below uh, a magnesium number of 80. If you look at the olivines from Leslie uh, and, and a group um, to Kimberlite, the crosses again are the, um, the edge compositions. This is that subpopulation that's iron rich relative to, to the edges, which I believe are the megacrists. And they show a, a, a much more restricted compositional range than you see at Let's Sing, going down to uh, about magnesium number of 90. Um, in, in the group two Newlands Kimberlites, you go down to about uh, magnesium number of 88. But in, in neither Leslie, uh, Lac de Gras, or um, the group two Kimberlites, do go down to these very iron rich compositions um, that you see at Bet Sing. And we suggest this is telling the same story that uh, um, at Monastery or Let Sing, both clipper uh, producers, um, you've had an extended range of crystallization towards iron rich compositions of the megacrysts extending into the diamond stability field. <coughs> Excuse me. At Lac de Gras and in Group Two Kimberlites, much more restricted megacrist uh, formation for whatever reason. Obviously, an important question, but terminates in the graphite stability field, and so you never crystallize clipper diamonds, or, or really. So um, these relationships suggest that clippers. Uh, help us explain the, or sorry, Megacris help us explain the absence of clippers. Um, uh, you don't get them when, when there's a restricted compositional range for the associated Megacrists. Um, we haven't cracked the question of predicting the presence of clippers. This is obviously a very important uh, question. It's still work in progress, um, but we suggest that the key is to refine our understanding of the megatris suite. But uh, there's an important corollary, and that's that if there's a link between megatris compositions and the absence of these clipper diamonds, this is consistent at least with a, a link between the megatris and the clipper diamonds, that the clippers are, are part of the megatris parogenesis. 
then um, it would be nice to um, have a, a, a something to try and test these different models. And we suggest that uh, Let Sing would be an ideal place to test these two models. And uh, what, what we feel should be done is that uh, an attempt should be made to get a, a larger proportion of stones with metal, iron, and carbide inclusions, perhaps by screening the, the diamonds through a magnetic separator and seeing whether this population is representative and different from the, the clippers, or whether, in fact, when you get uh, sufficient analyses, um, that these sublithospheric stones uh, begin to look uh, isotopically very similar to the associated clippers. So this is a potential way of distinguishing uh, between the two models that have been proposed. And I think that's a good place to cut off. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andy. That was very interesting. I um, attended a lecture earlier today by um, Evan Smith. So my mind is kind of uh, going in two different directions right now. Um, we're gonna start off with the question and answer period right now. And so if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them to me in the chat. Um, and if you just wanna raise your hand or just speak up, go, go right ahead, no problem. Um, I'll I'll get things going because I have a question of my own. Um, so one of the things that um, Evan was talking about today was the correlation between subduction zones and um, these clipper and type 2B type diamonds. Do you have any any thoughts on on that? Um, well, um, the, 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 the Cretaceous ones are certainly concentrated around the, um, the, the margins of the Karpval Craton, so that doesn't conflict with what Evan is saying at all. Um, whether that's linked in, so, so I think that's probably an important uh, observation. The, the, the outside is Premier, which is right in the middle of the Craton, but it's an 1100 uh, million year kimberlite, so it's an older kimberlite. But um, if you look at the Cretaceous kimberlites, sure, they are around the margin of the craton, so it doesn't rule out a, a subduction um, a, a link. It, I don't think it necessarily proves it there. Okay. Um... We have a question from Dylan Cohn in the chat. So I'll just read that out to you. Um, it says, you and many of the papers you cite view Megacris exclusively in the magmatic framework. However, most of those papers are over 40 years old. Recent Megacris literature is dominated by suggestions of a metasomatic organ, origin for the sweet. If a metasomatic origin for Kimberlitic uh, Megacris was accepted, how, if at all, would that change your interpretation on the origin of these diamonds, i.e. in the presence of a supercritical carbonate-rich fluid? Um, can I share my screen again? Yep. Yeah. Um, share. Um, and um, two, two issues here. Uh, if I can find it, sorry. Um, uh, two issues here. Um, and uh, one is that the model probably doesn't actually conflict at all with the metasomatic model. Um, there just wasn't time to discuss this, but um, uh, if you had a, a, a kimberlite magma in, in the mantle, uh, you'd probably 
get secondary partial melting in, um, uh, in, in the thermal aureole. So you'd have secondary fluid sloshing around. So um, I, I think uh, metasomatism is, is almost inevitable. So th that would be uh, almost um, uh, uh, something that had to be associated with the, the Megacris suite. So I, I don't think the model's in conflict with the, um, the Megacris model. But the original one, as opposed, <coughs> um, as proposed by um, John Gurney, was th this is one of the important pieces of evidence. And these are uh, garnet megacris from monastery. Uh, the, the black symbols are discrete megacrists. And the um, the open circles are, are, are garnets intergrown with ilmenite. And the pattern is the discrete uh, garnets show a trend of increasing titanium with crystallization. And then uh, you get an inversion and um, decreasing titanium uh, with, with crystallization of, of garnet um, uh, forming together with the uh, with ilmenite, and so this was in, in this, this was given as important evidence for megacrysts, and um, I don't see evidence like this addressed in uh, the metasomatic uh, models that want only metasomatism. I, I, I'm not at all averse to it. I think it's it's an inevitable consequence of the model, but it must be superimposed on this fractional crystallization model. And um, <clears throat> there was a paper by Rory Moore and um, uh, who is his co-worker. Um, uh, they looked at, at garnet megacris from I think 50 Kimberlites in South Africa. And they showed that they, the, the, the garnets def defined these long magnesium chrome trends, which they interpreted primarily as, as uh, magmatic crystallization. So I, I don't think the two models are, um, are are at odds. But if you if you want to completely rule out the, um, the the magmatic model, then you've got to explain trends like these and trends like the the long magnesium chrome trends of of garnets from I think fifty one different pipes explain how that would form in terms of, of metasomatism. So I think that the, the two are actually quite compatible, but I don't think you personally don't think you can rule out uh, the magmatic origin. Okay. But I did point out that megacris were uh, a, a controversial field. Uh, I think I, I, I came clean on that. Okay. Um, I, I have a question. I'm Dan Schultze. Uh, Andy. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? Hi. The, uh, the acicular uh, uh, or quench ilmenite orthoperoxenites that you put at the, the Henry Mears type, uh, that you put at the end of uh, end of mega crystallization as being um, equivalent to the framicytes. If so, where's the, why is there no ilmenite in the framicytes? Um, yeah, that's an important question, and, and you could also ask uh, why do you uh, get garnet as the most important inclusion? Um, I, I think the, as, as a general answer, um, you, you would have had to have had a change in fugacity and uh, to, to crystallize the diamond. It, it's something I didn't go into, but presumably those late stage liquids would have had to have been reduced against mantle wall rocks, maybe eclogites. Um, and so if you get a sudden reduction of the, the magma, you're going to change the, the phase uh, composition, you, you know, the phases in equilibrium. So I can't give you a specific answer to that. It's, it's an important question, uh, but I couldn't ask 
um, Maya to tell Dan that he should be at the pub this evening so that he wasn't here to ask uh, difficult questions. Uh, so I'm sure you have a couple more up your sleeve, uh, Dan. I have another question. What, what do you know about, I, nothing comes to mind, about the, uh, the oxygen isotope composition of the garnets in the framicytes? Because the megachrist oxygen is very, very restricted and very ordinary mantle. Uh, do you have, I, I don't know what the data are for the, for the uh, framicyte garnets. Um, I, it, it has been published and um, it's sort of on the edge of the, the mantle field. Um, and the, um, Dan, I just don't have enough, uh, I, I can't think of, of the exact diagram offhand. So, um, but it, it, it was on the edge of the mantle field. Um, whether that conflicts with the model, I don't know. Um, you, you know, the, um, the, the factors controlling um, the, the isotopic con uh, compositions, particularly the, the carbon isotopic composition is, is of course very controversial. Um, you've got Cartonier suggesting a fractionation model and the, the, the dominant model is always subduction. So, um, um, I think the interpretation of the isotopes is going to be controversial anyway. Do you have any more questions, Dan? Or... I'll give someone else a chance. Okay, um, we do have one in the chat from Evan Smith. Um, so Evan says, certainly lots to consider. Thank you for your wide range of observations. Can you comment on the correlation of Clifford diamonds with certain kinds of megachrist or frame sites? Is there something that stands out among the megachrist or frame sites at Cullinan, let's say, Karoe, et cetera, places where there is a notable Clipper population? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, uh, apart from the, uh, you know, the more general observation that um, there's a difference between the, the megachrists in group one and group two kimberlites, but um, uh, I don't know of any work that's, that's done that, Evan. Um, uh, but, you know, what the model suggests is that we should be looking um, closely at the megachrist suite and looking for things like this. I'm not sure if Evan, you have anything that you want to add to that. I don't see him popping up there. Evan says, thank you. Um, all right, does anyone else have anything that they'd like to ask? Uh, yes, I'd like to ask Andy, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I'm just thinking uh, about other ways we can check your model and the age of the diamond inclusions come to mind. So do you know, uh, like we should predict uh, the age close to the age of the kimberlite if those pramocytes uh, and clippers are megachrists. So do we know anything about ages of diamond inclusions in pramocytes and in Clipper diamonds. Um, th there's some in information, Maya, which was actually published very early on uh, by Dorit Jacob, and she reported one of the garnet inclusions as showing zoning, um, and, and and she suggested that, that this indi indicated a young age, and. Um, then some of them are show very low nitrogen aggregation states. Um, which which also indicates a low age, but many of the megachrists are, are unzoned, and um, sorry, many of the framocytes and and their inclusions are unzoned, um, 
and have higher aggregation states. So whether this young age applies to, to all of them is, is, is obviously an important question. But uh, one of the problems is that um, the, the megacris seem to have formed over a period of around about five to 10 years prior to eruption of the Kimberlite. And um, this should be required by pooled magma because uh, it would take some time to develop a, a thermal aureole. And as an, a thermal aureole expanded and temperatures increased, um, higher temperatures would cause rapid equilibration and it would also cause more rapid uh, nitrogen aggregation. So, um, um, so some of the, the diamonds, uh, the, the evidence suggests that they are young um, and pretty well just prior to Kimberlite eruption, like, like the megachrysts. But um, uh, if you had a megachryst formed 10 million years prior to uh, eruption or, or garnet in inclusion, um, and it sat there for 10 million years, and, and the temperatures were around about 1400, you'd get very rapid equilibration and very rapid nitrogen ag aggregation. So um, it might only be the very uh, last diamonds that still preserve these young ages, uh, that they would be overwritten at high temperatures. But that would be an important uh, aspect to try and study. Get, get more information on, certainly. Yeah, thank you. Following up on that, maybe uh, we have some unpublished data, maybe Evan or um, Dave Phillips, maybe you have uh, data on ages of inclusions in those types of diamonds, something that uh, you still not published. I'm certainly not aware of any data on those sorts of diamonds, not age data anyway. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I go and have my coffee or, or wine now, Mayor? Mm. Uh, we have a do we have a question for Herman before you go get your coffee or wine? Um, Herman is asking, how come we never find diamonds of any nature as inclusions in megacrisp sweets? Um, yeah, I mean that that's an important question. Um, the first part of the answer is that. Um, that diamonds only uh, crystallize right at the end. Um, um, so it's only it, it, it's only the late crystallizing megacrysts that we'd find. And um, the inclusions in, in uh, framer sites actually match um, megacryst inclusions. So why we don't have diamonds in megacrysts, I think, falls away because you've got megacrist inclusions in diamonds based on their composition and, and the uh, parallels like the, the chrome rich and chrome poor sweets. So, um, and of course, most megacrists don't have inclusions. Uh, they, they, they do occur, but they're rare. So, um, but I, I, I think the fact that you've got megacrist inclusions in framer sites um, based on their composition, um, uh, addresses that question, Herman, or not? Uh, I'm just gonna unmute myself. Uh, look, I take exception to your, um, your connection between Websterites and Megacrysts. Um, and if I am allowed to share my screen quickly. Yeah, go ahead. I will show you why. This is the paper that describes the Angola megacrisp suites that you uh, quoted. 
um, Andy. It was written by Andy Rogers and myself. It's a very big database of, of, of very evolved metacrits that we described from these Angolan Kimberlites. But the thing I wanted to point out is these two diagrams were put there precisely because the one on the right separates Websterites from megacrysts and evolved megacrysts. And the one on the left, which everybody uses, does not. So this diagram on the left is a sodium titanium plot, a titanium sodium plot that many people use to separate megacrist compositions from diamond inclusion, eclogitic, and Webster really comp comp compositions, uh, which fall down here at lower titanium. These megacrysts that we described from these Angolan candlelights are in white symbols, and they go outside the traditional megacrist field, and they start overlapping uh, at higher sodium content and equivalent titanium content with you know, eclogitic uh, and websteroidic inclusions in diamonds. If you go to the right-hand side diagram, which is the same magmatic fractionation series that you showed for monastery, right? It's a titanium magnesium number plot for the same data set. And you can see traditional megacrysts are in black over here. And then these evolved megacrysts coexist with ilmenite. They fall down in titanium content, but in the Angolan example and all the monastery examples, they all fall inside this little extended box over here with dashed lines. And that's what we define in this paper is an extended megacrist field. And it is separated from these lower, lower uh, titanium, but potentially higher sodium garnets that are Eclogitic garnets, Websteritic garnets, pyroxenitic garnets, the same ones that you contend in quench texture are equivalent to megacrysts. They are not. Um, this is a worldwide data set. It's published in 2009. And the reason we published it is because we defined uh, an extended megacrist field and we used a different plot that people normally use to make that point. Um, let me just get a share. Oh, could I share my screen again? Sure. sure. Um, Go ahead, Andy. Um, let's do Um, the, this, this is the plot from your 2004 paper, mm -hmm. Herman, and um, um, this was the line that you suggested, separating uh, megachrists and websterites, and um, these are the framosite garnets from, uh, uh, from the uh, Vienna collection. And and they, they they cover both your megacrist field and the um, um, and, and and your websterite field, but um, I, I think one could argue about you know where you actually draw these lines, but um, the, the, you you have to also address these very really striking parallels. Uh, which you don't see in the in, in the Websterites, um, the fact that the the, the megachrists uh, and and the and the, the, the framosite garnets have these chrome rich and chrome poor populations, uh, the evidence that they crystallized at the same time, and I, I think the the question is uh, which of these is more important, um, you know. We, we know that there's a big overlap between the Websterites, uh, I mean, in, in the original uh, 
publication. The pink was the, the megachrist field, the, the, the lining uh, were Websterites or, or um, peroxenites. And um, so there is a big overlap, but um, they're, they're very, very distinctive features, which I think are, are arguing that there, there has to be a link uh, between these inclusions and, and the megachrists. And to my knowledge, you, you don't get chrome rich and chrome poor Websterites, for instance. And uh, the Websterites uh, seem to be much older. Most people want to link them to, to old subduction zones. Um, so to my knowledge, I haven't seen evidence uh, um, in, in Southern Africa for, for young Websterites, for instance. I, I know you do get them um, in, in Canada. Um, so, but those Websterites look quite similar to megachrists. Uh, can you just explain something to me, Andy? Um, you say here, yeah, uh, the, the legend in the, on the right-hand diagram, it says Websteritic Association, and then in, you've got a symbol for Ecloderic Periteric. Uh, okay. Um, what did, what the, does that symbology mean? Um, th th there's a big um, problem with uh, terminology with these, these framesites, and they they... Uh, that was just using the, the terminology in the paper, but um, uh, the, the eclogitic ones are basically the chrome poor ones, the prolytitic are the chrome rich ones, and there's, there's some intermediate ones. So um, uh, um, different people have used different terminology. I just use the terminology in, in, in the paper that, that this data comes from. So, so the eclogitic would be the chrome poor suite, the prolytitic would be the chrome rich suite. Um, uh, and and this, this would be a misnomer because olivine is never a, an inclusion. So, so um, we, we prefer to simply use the, the terminology chrome rich and chrome poor, but that's just taking the, the terminology from, from the original paper. Um, so Tom asked a question in the chat as well, and he said, can he ask the reverse of Herman's question? Why don't we see megachrist mineral inclusions in clipper diamonds or do we? Um, well, um, there's the question, uh, Brayart is an inclusion and, um, that's going to, if you have a an evolved liquid um, which is calcium and carbonate rich, um, that's perfect in, environment for brayite to form at the low end of the megachrist suite, and I would suggest that the brayite is in fact part part of the megachrist suite. Um, and, but the problem, of course, is is uh, the interpretation of the brayite. It's 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 stable under lithospheric conditions. But some, some brayite almost certainly has inverted from the high pressure form. So, um, but. Uh, uh, oh, where's, where's my, sorry. I, so, um, uh, so I, I would suggest that the brayite is just a late crystallizing megachrist phase. Um, you, you, you certainly, with your megachrist suite, you've got a, a calcium and carbonate rich uh, residual magma. Um, the Uh, th th this diamond here, for instance, had it, it's a clipper diamond. It had four brayite inclusions, and uh, um, you know, it, so it's a question of whether those are sublithospheric or or, or megachristic. But you wouldn't you wouldn't expect the 
the high temperature megachrysts to be present as inclusions, of course. It's, it's only the, 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 the very late phases. And, and that gets back on, on, you know, to Dan's question of, of uh, why don't you see ilmenite? And uh, presumably, if you um, if, if you have a, a change in FO2, which would be necessary, you're going to change phase relationships as well. And uh, th that's possibly why we, we only see garnets as well as the dominant inclusion in these framosites. Thanks, Andy. Um, if you're seeing the garnets in the framosites, why not in, in the clippers as well? Um, Tom, I, I, I don't know. Um, so, um, and I, I suppose one of the problems is that, that you, you know, is, is just getting samples of these big stones. So it, it might just be a, a, a lack of samples, but, uh, um, but that, that's a very good question. And, and uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Uh, Andy, we can uh, further uh, follow on your um, plot for um, monastery garnets, uh, titanium against MG number. Can we show that? Yeah, this one. So when you showed that, you said that you explain it easily with magmatic model, but you have difficulty explaining it with metasomatic model. I would say that it's, it is easily explained by metasomatism. If you uh, step away from thinking that here you have early uh, magnesium rich crystallization, and then you go into later more evolved magmatic crystallization. So think uh, not in terms of early and late, but think about spatial distribution of uh, in the metasomatic column. And if you have a metasomatic column in the channel of the protokimbolite penetration, then you go from magnesium rich mantle to more iron rich protokimbolite melt. And that will give you that variety that you have here. And in order to see how you can explain that, um, that break in the slope, uh, it is easily explained by co uh, yeah, co-forming of uh, ilmenite, and ilmenite would take all the titanium, so that's uh, not a problem at all. Well, I think the the, the point is that the, these are single crystals, and these are single garnets, and these garnets intergrain with ilmenite, <coughs> and. Um, um, you know, that, those are the textures that you'd expect from magmatic crystallization. When, when garnet was forming it on its own, it would be uh, not intergrown. And then uh, we, we know ilmenite is a late forming phase in, in the megacrist suite. And, um, and you have to see this against the background of these magnesium chrome arrays in, in the garnets. And I, I, I would find, you know, that's been interpreted to reflect a, a primary um, magmatic crystallization. And um, I, I think that's very dif difficult to explain in terms of metasomatism. But I, I, I don't think the two models are um, necessarily incompatible because um, as I pointed out, um, you, you probably, if you had a, a stalled magma body in the mantle, it's probably going to trigger secondary um, melting, and, and those melts will interact with early formed megacrysts. And, and the evidence, as, as I understand it, for a, um, a, a metasomatic imprint is largely isotopic. Um, 
but I don't think the two are, are, are necessarily incompatible. So um, I would see the metasomatism as, as superimposed on, on the primary um, um, mag magmatic crystallization trend. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure what other criteria you can develop to try and distinguish between the two, but certainly that 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 looks like a magmatic trend to me. Uh, um, that, that would be a classical. Okay, thank you. There is a, this is Dan. There is evidence for metasomatism, and it's in the peridotypes. It's in the zoned garnets, for example, that go from chromium rich to the to uh, to chromium poor on the edge. They go from low titanium to high titanium core to rim, and uh, those are inhomogeneous things. And that is the metasomatism. Exactly. No, no, absolutely. Um, so so uh, there's no doubt that there's metasomatism around. Now, I've, 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 I don't have a problem with that, but um, uh, so, you know, th those garnets, I mean, way back, um, Joe Boyd argued that they'd interacted with the megacrist liquid, um, which, which I, I guess is metasomatism. And, um, and in fact, if you look at those garnets and the sheared peridotites, there's a whole array of compositions that, the, the sheared peridotite garnets are intermediate in composition between the, the coarse peridotites and the um, and, and the high the high magnesium megacrysts. So um, so you're certainly getting metasomatism around, but I don't think that necessarily means that everything is metasomatism. And it's that's metasomatism will, will particularly imprint on um, Isotopic signatures, which, which has been the you know the evidence put forward for the uh, for the uh, you know the the imprint imprint of metasomatism. So um, so I'm very happy that there's been a, a metasomatic imprint, but um, you, you know you get um, if if you look at in, inclusions in in megacrysts, if if the if the host megacrist is more magnesium rich, the, the inclusion shows a sympathetic variation. So, the, you know, this is one of the other lines of evidence for the magmat magmatic model. So, I was agreeing with you, Andy. Um, the, the diagram you have on the page now is showing it homogeneous things, uh, not the inhomogeneity you find in the metasomatized peridotites. I, I agree that yeah, this is a magmatic yeah. trend. Yeah. Okay. Do we have anyone else who has anything to add before we stop recording here? Nope. Okay. Well, I am going to stop the recording right now.